Chapter 14 Annika ended up in the last place she thought she'd ever be. Jail. She paced for hours in the cell, her mind whirling, heart aching. She didn't even know if Cameron was alive, much less the state he was in. She needed to be by his side, not here. Annika didn't know the mugger's condition either, but considering what he had done to Cameron, she almost didn't care. Almost. She caught herself pulling and messing with the bracelet Cameron had made her. It reminded her of her current state of mind. Over the past few months, she'd been hanging on by a thread, clinging to Cameron and his bright and positive nature. But if she lost him, she knew she'd fray and break. She took a closer look, noticing discoloration on some of the letters. It was blood, Cameron's blood that he had lost in order to protect her. A wave of nausea swept over her, and she went to her knees, hand to her mouth. Footsteps moved toward her cell. She looked up, hoping it was a guard to tell her someone had bailed her out. She was surprised, but glad to see Detective Harrison. She jumped to her feet. Detective! Monica gripped the bars of the cell, her knuckles white. How's Cameron? Is he okay? I talked to one of the nurses. She said he's stable for now. But he lost so much blood that he went into shock and his jaw set. Annika, he's in a coma. She blinked, let out a stuttering breath, hid her face, shut her eyes, shut her ears to the news. A coma? What if he never woke up? And even if he did, what shape would he be in? I'm so sorry, Annika. I know you two are close. She felt her lip tremble, but she refused to break down. After all, the news could have been worse. At least Cameron was still alive. Is that all they told you? she asked. He nodded grimly. Okay, well, what about the mugger? Is he... he's recovering from the surgery right now. Her body relaxed a fraction. Good. Now, can you tell me why I'm here? What did I do wrong? Kid, you shot the guy twice in the back. He was fleeing the scene. He was no longer a threat. It was self-defense! He put Cameron in a coma! He put up a hand to quiet her. I know, I know. Look, you did what any normal person would do in that situation. I'm just telling you what's on the police report, though I doubt it will even go to trial. But Annika, we also found a bullet embedded in the ground. Wait, you're saying I shot three times? The first one missed. That's probably when he started running. Everything just happened so fast. And after all that, I still didn't save Cameron. You did save him. If you hadn't fired, that mugger might have killed both of you. A shiver rippled through her, and she rubbed her arms. I don't know what was wrong with that guy. Right when we handed him the money, he started swinging that knife. His eyebrows furrowed. That doesn't make sense. Muggers usually take cash and split. I know, that's what was so weird about the whole thing. Maybe he was high? Maybe he didn't want any witnesses? Didn't want us to identify him? People that are high aren't going to take the time to wear gloves. And he wouldn't have to worry about being identified because he was wearing a mask. What do you think it means? Maybe he had a different goal altogether. Her eyes widened. Is in killing one of us? Both of us? Maybe. The minute he's awake, I'm questioning him. But with all that said, I think the safest place for you is right here. What? Well, what about Cameron? I know how badly you want to see him, Annika. But you're both safer where you are. Trust me. Just let me talk to the Megger. Find out what's going on. Something tells me this guy could be connected to the murder case. Something bigger than just a mugging. If he was just some random person that went too far trying to rob you, then I will personally escort you to the hospital to see Cameron. Okay? She bit her lip, took a deep breath. Okay, thank you. He reached through the bars to grip her shoulder. Your friend's a fighter, Annika. You hang in there and keep fighting right alongside with him. Unable to sleep that night, Annika lay in her cot, eyes burning. Thoughts of Cameron and her bleak situation wouldn't leave her. She hated being trapped here, stuck at the mercies of visitors to keep her updated on Cameron. If she could get out of here, she could see him, hold his hand. Maybe she would be the first one he laid eyes on when he awoke. If he awoke. Shuddering, Annika rolled on her side, bunching the sheets in her fists. 
Annika, a familiar voice called. She turned, and her face lit up, seeing her father's brother, Uncle Isaac. How had he known where to find her? Theo! She ran over to the cell door and took his offered hands. What are you doing here? Crystal called me and told me where you were, so I jumped on the first flight here. Crystal? How did she know? She said Detective Harrison called her to let her know what was going on, for your sake. Wow, he's always looking out for me. Are you alright? he asked. Um, I'm okay, I guess. So much better now that you're here. It's just so scary and lonely, and I'm so worried about Cameron. How's he doing? What happened to him? She gave him the brunt of it, barely finishing before breaking down into tears. On again. Shh. He rubbed her shoulder gently. It's okay. Take a deep breath. I'm so sorry. Listen, your Thea and I are going to get you out of here, okay? We'll take you to see Cameron. It may take us a few days to raise the money, but... No, Theo, she began, sniffling. Because of the strange circumstances with the mugger, Detective Harrison thinks I should stay here, for my own safety, until he's able to talk to him. Oh. All right. That makes sense. I just... I don't want to leave you here. It sounded like he would be talking to him soon. I'll be okay, Theo. Annika summoned a smile. I'm a Vienta. Yes, you are, he answered, returning the smile. Here. Crystal packed you a bag and I brought you this to read. He handed her the backpack and a large, leather-bound, black book. It was her Bible, the one her parents had given her so long ago. Read it, Annika. It's the only way you'll find peace. She nodded. They talked for a few more minutes, but already the guard was saying that their time was up. Don't worry, her uncle said. God's got you. I'll come again and visit you soon, okay? Okay. Thank you so much, Theo. I don't know what I'd do without you. I love you. He smiled, pressing a kiss to her hand. I love you too. Sitting on her cot, Annika looked at the Bible in her lap. It had been her parents' graduation present to her, and for the next two years, she had studied it faithfully. Yet since the fire, she had refused to read it. Until now. With resolve, she opened the book and read the inscription from her parents. To our beautiful Annika, we love you more than we can say and are so proud of the young woman you have become. We've highlighted several of our favorite verses for you to guide you as you enter this new chapter in your life. Always keep him first and you'll never go wrong. Love, Dad and Mom. Annika wiped at the tears absent-mindedly and started flipping through the pages, searching for the highlighted verses. Deuteronomy 32.4 He is the rock. His works are perfect and all his ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong, upright and just is he. Annika felt a pain in her chest. What was upright and just about the murder of her parents? Job 34, 12 through 13 and 17. It is unthinkable that God would do wrong, that the Almighty would pervert justice. Who appointed him over the earth? Who put him in charge of the whole world? Can he who hates justice govern? Will you condemn the just and mighty one? Isaiah 45, 9. Woe to him who quarrels with his maker. Does the clay say to the potter, What are you making? Her stomach churned. 2 Corinthians 4, 8 and 9. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. Annika had been feeling crushed, in despair, abandoned, and just about destroyed for the past three years. Cameron's words suddenly came back to her. The same words she had so easily brushed off now clung to her mind and wouldn't let go. He had said that people needed Jesus within them, filling them with the Holy Spirit so they couldn't be crushed. Sure, she had picked up the pieces, put herself back together in a working form, but it was a dead form. The only thing keeping her going had been finding and punishing her parents' murderer. But even if the trial had gone well, and Maxwell had been convicted, even if Cameron survived, she knew she would still be incomplete, still ruled by her emotions and circumstances. She needed God. She needed him to empty her heart of all her desires so he could completely fill it with his. 1 Kings 19.12 and after the fire came a gentle whisper. After the fire.
God had been there, whispering that he was still with her, wanting to comfort her. She had just been too prideful and stubborn to see it. She had been in the prison cell since the day her parents died. Over time, she had let the bitterness, guilt, and self-pity consume her. It had molded over her heart and hardened it to the point of her losing her faith and her happiness. Instead of letting go, instead of appreciating what she did have, the Lord, Cameron, family, friends, she dwelled on what she had lost. She had stopped thinking about others and just focused on her own pain, which had gotten her nowhere. Isaiah 57, 1-2 The righteous perish, and no one ponders it in his heart. Devout men are taken away, and no one understands that the righteous are taken away to be spared from evil. Those who walk uprightly enter into peace. They find rest as they lie in death. It hit her like a ton of bricks. Her parents were at peace. They were resting, waiting for Christ's return. They were ready. She wasn't. 1 Peter 1, 6-7 In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Those have come so that your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. In the past, Annika had always considered herself to be a strong Christian, but nothing had ever happened in her life to really test that strength. God had allowed painful events to happen for her own good, to show her that her strength was not enough, for her to realize who she was and who God is. She had made the past three years much more difficult than they ever had to be, but God was using this time in her life to shape and refine her into the person he knew she had the capability of being. 2 Corinthians six eighteen, I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Matthew twenty three thirty seven. How often I have longed to gather your children together, as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you are not willing. The words blurred. She had been the unwilling one, always resisting. But God would be a father to her. He still loved her that much. Even after she had rejected him, she had a father and mother wrapped up in the one and only God. She went to her knees, forehead touching the cold floor, in full surrender. In that jail cell, Anna Gavienta uttered the four words she should have prayed the night her parents died. God, I need you. She paused, waiting for more words to come. She felt a certain stillness, quietness, peace wash over her as she knelt there, silent in his presence. I've been so blind, Lord. I'm so sorry for blaming you for what's happened in my life. I'm nothing, and yet you still want me. You still want to be my father. Please forgive me. Come into my life again, my heart, and be Lord and Savior over me. Thank you for giving me your son to take the punishment I deserve. I used to think that I could never feel you, but I was the one pushing you away. Thank you for never leaving me and for giving me another chance to spend eternity with you. And thank you that I will see my parents again. Please be with Cameron. Please, Father, save him. But I know now that you are in control. Let your will be done. Whatever happens, give me the strength to endure, to never leave you again. She took a deep breath, wondering if she could get this last request out. And please help me let go of the hate I feel for Maxwell. Take this anger from my heart. Fill it with your peace. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The ache in her chest left immediately. She felt herself smile through the tears. How could God forgive her after everything? How could he come to her aid the very moment she asked? Because he is good all the time. He is a loving father. Now, her father. Over the next couple of days, Annika continued to read faithfully, clinging to the words like a lifeline, keeping her mind occupied with good things instead of focusing on fear of the unknown. Her uncle Isaac had visited her yesterday and had been overjoyed at her renewal of faith in the Lord. 
They had spent their time together praying and studying the word. It had uplifted her even more so than his last visit. It felt so good to be back in God's arms and his care. She hoped she'd be able to share the good news with Cameron. Whenever she felt anxiety crawling back to her, she'd pray and feel the fear diminish. Cameron and she were in God's hands. Picking up her Bible again, she leafed through the pages until she came to a bookmark. Taking a second look, she realized it wasn't a bookmark at all. It was a letter with her name on it. How long had that been there? Unfolding the paper, she began to read. Annika. I was looking at the notes to a complicated piece in my piano book, and I figured this was how you see your life now. A jumbled mess. That's exactly what it looks like to someone who doesn't understand what's going on. But to the composer, he sees a beautiful song just waiting to be played. Right now in your life, though you may see brokenness and chaos, God sees beauty just waiting to be displayed to a dark world. You have a future, Annika. God is here for you, and he loves you even more than I do. Cameron. Her hand went to her mouth. How had she not seen this? His love for her. Everything started to come back to her now. How he was there for her after the verdict, not prying for answers, just holding her until she was able to tell him what was on her heart. His look of adoration at times when they would make eye contact, the gifts he had given her, his gentle hand on her shoulder whenever she had been feeling insecure or vulnerable. The night she had been shot, she vaguely remembered hearing him saying, don't leave me. Don't leave me, Cameron, she whispered back. Please, please be with him, Lord, she prayed. Feeling anxious again, Annika scanned her Bible, searching for an encouraging verse. Something that her mother had told her years ago suddenly came to mind. To get a glimpse of God's perspective, to see if your best friend is possibly that special someone, put his name in place of the word love in 1 Corinthians 13. She turned to that passage and began reading. Love is patient. Cameron is patient. Cameron is kind. He does not envy or boast. He is not proud. She kept going down, down, down the line. He never fails. He hadn't failed to protect her that night of the mugging. Even a few miles away in a hospital room, Cameron hadn't failed to speak to her, witness to her, comfort her in a time of most need. Now, she replaced Cameron's name with the one who was love itself. God is extremely patient. He is immensely kind. He keeps no record of wrongs. She was clean, washed in Jesus' blood, forgiven. God had never failed her, and he never would. He was in control. Annika lay down on her cot, her back to the cell door. Closing her eyes, she hugged the book to her heart, absorbing what she'd read. In spite of everything happening around her, she felt God's peace. She had never felt his presence as strongly before. The jingling of keys and footsteps pulled Annika from her thoughts. Hey, my little jailbird. Annika's heart skipped a beat. Her stomach lurched. She knew that voice, that bright, teasing, loving tone of her best friend. But no, she had to have been just wishing to hear his voice. It was impossible. Annika turned around and saw a tall, slim build, jet black hair that shot up in every which way, blue inviting eyes, Cameron. The guard was opening the door, letting him in. Cameron! Annika ran to him and threw her arms around his neck, crying and laughing all at once. Relief flooding through her, she sent a silent prayer of thanks heavenward. How is this possible? He groaned through a laugh. Ugh, still haven't healed up all the way. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry, she stammered, letting go. How are you here? Detective Harrison said you were in a coma. What happened? Are you okay? I'll tell you everything for a much needed cup of coffee. And yes, I'm fine. Just a little sore. He smiled down at her. The doctors didn't want me to leave just yet, but I couldn't resist being the one to come get you. Wait, get me out of here? Yes, ma'am. I paid your bail and I am busting you out of this place. I got the A-OK -okay from Detective Harrison. Overwhelmed, she hugged him again, being careful this time. Thank you, Cameron. I've missed you, she whispered. I've missed you too, beautiful. Moving her arm through his, Annika walked with him to the exit. There were a hundred questions wanting to leap off her tongue, but she held them back for now and just relaxed in his presence. Somehow, by the grace of God, Cameron was okay. He was here with her, 
and she was going to start truly appreciating him from now on. She couldn't believe how fast her feelings had changed toward him. Somewhere, in the middle of all the worry and stress behind those bars, hoping and praying he would recover, she knew that she wanted to spend the rest of her life with him. But there was also a part of her that knew she had been in love with him for some time now. With everything else on the forefront of her mind, though, she hadn't let herself really think about it. She couldn't imagine a day without him. Couldn't imagine finding anyone else like him. She knew Cameron wasn't perfect. No one was. But she knew he was the one for her. The one God had chosen for her. Sweet, down-to-earth, selfless, compassionate. Her best friend. That was what a relationship was supposed to be based on. Friendship. Monica called her Uncle Isaac to tell him the good news of her being released and invited him to meet her and Cameron at Cup of Kindness. Her uncle was waiting for them at the door as Cameron and Annika drove up. As soon as the trio walked inside the coffee shop, Jake and Crystal practically tackled Annika in a group hug. Boss, welcome back, Jake exclaimed. Crystal was nearly crying. We're so glad y'all are okay. Cameron and Uncle Isaac joined in, wrapping their arms around them. Annika hugged them back, soaking up the love and warmth she felt with these friends, with this family. Jake and Crystal went back to work, taking care of everything, letting her relax with her uncle and Cameron. Annika promised to tell them her story, but they seemed more interested in her catching her breath right now. She could tell all later. Sitting down in a booth with the two most important men in her life, Annika realized the symbolism of the seating arrangement. Cameron had always been there for her, beside her. Her uncle had never been far away, always within arm's reach. Cameron, I still can't believe you're okay, she said. Yeah, me either, he replied. But what I really couldn't believe was when Detective Harrison told me you had been arrested. Yeah, but you did me some good to sit in there. Gave me time to think. And pray. Really? he asked. She smiled, glancing at her uncle. Yeah, I... I gave my life back to Christ in there. Cameron appeared to be speechless, so she kept talking. I realized I had been so wrong, and that the only way for me to be truly happy would be to have him in my life. I'd like to get baptized, maybe in your church, Cam, if possible. Finding his voice, Cameron hugged her again. Annika, I'm so happy for you! Praise the Lord! That is, that's the best news ever! I'm so proud of you! She laughed, returning his hug. It's thanks to you guys. You're the one who witnessed to me, Cameron. Showed me what it's like to be at peace despite your circumstances. And Theo, your kindness and prayers and my Bible you brought me. The verses Mom and Dad highlighted for me. It's like God was speaking to me with those verses. Answered my questions, calmed my fears. I can't thank either of you enough. Uncle Isaac had tears in his eyes. You just did. Jake appeared with three cups of coffee and set them on the table. Thanks, Jake, she said. Her phone buzzed in her pocket and she pulled it out. It's Detective Harrison, she announced, sounding excited. Her uncle nodded, telling her to answer. Annika didn't need to be told twice. She slid the screen to answer. Hello? Well, I see your friend wasted no time in getting you out, he said, the smile in his voice evident. No, he certainly didn't. Annika, I'm calling because I've got some startling news. Her eyebrows furrowed. Okay. What is it? she asked, bracing herself. The mugger is going to be okay, but you're never going to believe this. He was hired by Maxwell Collins. What? she asked. Why? To kill Cameron. Her eyes dilated. What? she asked again, more alarmed this time. Her uncle and Cameron exchanged glances. What's wrong? their eyes asked her. I know, Detective Harrison continued. But again, Maxwell was extremely drunk when he arranged all this. He's kicking himself now, but it's too late. He still denies having anything to do with the earlier attempt on your life, Annika, and your parents' death. But we've got him this time, for sure. Her mouth went dry. Cameron silently took her hand, offering support. Annika, Detective Harrison said, you there? Yes, sorry, she answered. Um, wow. <laughs> Thank you, Detective, for telling me. I appreciate it. I, I don't even know what to think right now. No, I understand. I'll keep you posted, and you do the same for me, all right? Yes, sir, I will. Thank you. As she hung up, Cameron asked, You okay? She relayed the news, and his grip tightened on hers. I can't believe that, he murmured. But we got him! We got him! 
We did it, she exclaimed. Wow, thank you, Lord. Uncle Isaac grabbed his cell phone. This is incredible. I'm going to call your Thea and let her know. Okay, Annika nodded as he headed outside. She looked back at Cameron. I can't believe God worked everything out like that. And so soon. He's so good. All the time, Cameron agreed. She smiled. So, tell me, when were you released from the hospital? What happened? Oh, that was nothing short of a miracle, he answered. When I woke up this morning, one of the nurses told me they had brought in some experimental serum, and it worked. It brought me out of the coma. To me, it just felt like waking up after a long nap. Her face paled. Wait, back up. A serum brought you out of the coma? Yeah, I know it sounds crazy, but what was it called? The serum that cured you, she asked intently. Uh, I don't really remember. It didn't have a name exactly. It was technical in letters and numbers. She had stopped breathing. HPX 200? Yeah, I think that's it. How'd you know? His eyebrows furrowed. Monica, what's wrong? Where did they get it? He shrugged. I don't know. All I know is that it was an experimental drug that my dad knew about. I guess he brought it in. Cameron shifted in his seat, disturbed by her demeanor. Monica, what is it? She stared, her eyes burning with an intensity she'd never felt before. Cameron? I think I know who really killed my parents. And who tried to kill me. But if we're going to prove it, I'm going to need you to do something for me.